Hey, I'm Shane and I have a question for you. Have you ever been so emotionally invested in a book that you just can't wait to find out what happens? If you have, maybe you flip to the table of contents to read the chapter titles and see if they contain any clues about the plot. Or maybe you felt like this while binging a Netflix series and after watching a few jaw-dropping episodes, you check to see how many seasons and episodes are left to watch until you find out what happens. I've done that with The Mandalorian. It's not Netflix, but it's not important. Anyways, by looking at a table of contents, we can see individual chapters or episodes within the context of the whole story from beginning to end. And this series, it's titled Table of Context. And the hope here is that by looking at the context of the Bible, we can better understand and maybe even come to love the story of God as told in the Bible. But more importantly, better understand and love God. See, if any book needs a table of context, it's definitely the Bible. The Bible is no joke. Some people, they love reading the Bible, but others feel intimidated at the thought of reading it. And honestly, I totally get that. Maybe when you read the Bible, it makes total sense and it encourages you. But maybe when you read the Bible, you come away with more questions than you had before you started reading it. If that last bit is true for you, I can see how you might feel both confused and frustrated, maybe even anxious about the idea of the Bible. If the Bible is from God and for us, people like you and me, then why wouldn't God make it easy for everyone to understand it? If you have questions about the Bible, then you should just ask someone that knows a lot about the Bible, right? Well, I mean, yes, that can be helpful, but before you get too excited, I'll remind you that different people actually believe different things about the Bible. And you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. You asked a question to a few people and each of them gave you a different answer. Yet, they all spoke with authority, like they knew the right way to understand whatever it was that you were asking them about in the Bible. And because of that, you're still confused. Or maybe you could care less about reading or understanding the Bible. I mean, maybe you've seen how the Bible has been used to judge, hurt, and exclude other people, and you don't want any part of that, which makes sense, that's fair, and I'm with you on that. But what if that's not what the Bible is for? In fact, I would say that's not at all what the Bible is for. So you might be asking, okay, then what is the Bible for? Well, some people look at it as a history book. Some look at it like a cup of coffee. It's like a way to wake up and just feel better about the day. Some people read it as fiction and some people act like it's an instruction manual with like the details of everything you're supposed to do and not do in life. And isn't it even true that some people use it as sort of a weapon? But what's the Bible for really? Like, what's the point? And backing up a little bit, who even wrote this thing called the Bible and how long ago did they write it? I mean, it's 2023 and with what we know about science, how can we actually take the Bible seriously? Those are some really big questions, but I want you to know that this is a safe place for all questions. And if I had to guess, I imagine almost all of us have even more questions about the Bible than what I just mentioned. And you don't have to put aside your curiosity, doubt, or frustration with the Bible when you show up here. Be open and be honest. You don't need to fake anything. Now, let me be clear. There's just no way that we'll be able to answer every question that you have about the Bible in this series. But the hope is that you'll leave here with a few answers about the Bible that will be sort of like a table of context. Answers to help you see that all of the stories in the Bible are actually telling one big story of God and God's love for all people. So with that in mind, let's take a look at your Bible's actual table of contents and you'll see that the Bible is actually divided into two sections. What we call the Old Testament or the Hebrew Scriptures, which is the beginning of the story of God's relationship with God's people. And then there's the New Testament, the story continued with the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and the beginning of the church. The Bible is actually a collection of historical documents, poems, letters, eyewitness accounts, teaching, songs, and other kinds of writings. We call each separate writing a book, and there's actually 66 books in the Bible, that one big book. These books were written at different times throughout history by different people, some known and some of them unknown. But all of them were leaders of God's people who were instructed by God to write what they wrote. The writings were then passed down from generation to generation, kept safe by scribes who had the important job of preserving the writings and carefully making more copies. The Bible as we know it was put together by leaders of the early church who were able to tell which books were authentic. Okay, so with all of that context in mind, I want you to look at one of the eyewitness accounts of Jesus's life, which means that it was in which part of the Bible? Okay, yeah, 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 you, you get it, it was in the New Testament. It was written by John, who was actually one of Jesus's best friends. He, he knew Jesus personally. And John actually lived longer than any of the other disciples or, or, or closest friends of Jesus. And then when he was old, he decided to write down what he remembered about Jesus. He may have been one of the last people living who actually 
remembered hanging out with Jesus. Okay, so with all of that in place, John starts his account like this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, you might be thinking, this sounds kind of like a riddle. Well, <laughs> you're right, it kind of does, but give me just a minute to try to explain what's going on here. You see, John was Jewish like Jesus, and he grew up learning the Jewish scriptures, what we talked about earlier, a lot of what we call the Old Testament. He would have known the story where God speaks all of creation into existence that can be found in Genesis chapter one. Throughout the Jewish scriptures, the word of God was described as having the very nature and power of God. God's word was more than just a bunch of sounds or syllables. God's word is God's essence, the exact representation of God's character and power. Uh, okay, cool. Well, maybe you learned something new, but so far John really hasn't said anything new to the average Jewish reader. But wait, here comes the plot twist. He continued, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Okay, John, this is something serious that's happening here, right? Like John is letting us all in on what he got to know and experience firsthand. That's who Jesus is, the word of God. When John refers to Jesus as the word of God, he's saying that Jesus has always existed with God, has acted with God. Like when God created the heavens and the earth, Jesus was a part of that and has the same nature and power as God. These are some really serious statements to make about someone. John is making it really clear that Jesus isn't just your average guy. Despite growing up in that little town in Northern Israel and on the outside looking like any other Jewish man, Jesus was different. Jesus is the word and the word is God. That means Jesus is God. Okay, so God is the main character here, and that's why we call the Bible the Word of God. The Bible tells us who God is and what God is about. The historical accounts, poems, stories, letters, and everything else in the Bible all points to God. God's story is the story of the Bible. And early on in God's story, when the Old Testament was written, God told prophets what God was like, and then the prophets would pass on what God said to everybody else. But today we have the whole Bible, the whole story of God. And we can know who God is through Jesus and the stories that we get to read about him in the Bible. One Jewish writer who wrote to new followers of Jesus in a letter that is now known as the book of Hebrews described it in this way. Long ago, God spoke many times and in many ways to our ancestors through the prophets. And now in these final days, he has spoken to us through his son. And that's Jesus. And Jesus is the perfect image of God, the clear and complete way to see God. So when we know Jesus, we know God. And while we can't possibly know everything about God, the more we look at Jesus, the more we will see God. Maybe you wanna think about it this way. How many of you love to cook? Okay, I, I, I don't, but I like to eat cooked food. That's really, really helpful. And you know, at some point, all of us, we've either used or we've seen one of these, right? It's like a sift or a filter, a strainer, whatever you wanna call it. And maybe the last time that you ate those incredible French fries from McDonald's, they poured them into a filter so that all the oil isn't all over your fries that they served you. That's kind of the point of something like this. Well, when it comes to reading the Bible, we're gonna let Jesus be our filter. Jesus is gonna be your filter when you read. So you pour things through that filter and you wind up with those contents being a little bit separated. Well, what is consistent with what you know and have seen to be true in Jesus' life and words, those are the things that you pay attention to. You hold on to that. You could even say that's what's left when Jesus is your filter and you wanna eat that. Well. There will still be some parts that, that go through. I mean, you can see some little particles and other things that made it through, even though this filter is pretty incredible. You're still gonna have some questions and that's okay. We all have parts that confuse us. We may even come back to some of those questions later in the series, or maybe you'll come back to them later in your life or later in high school. But for now, when we're thinking about the way we think about and the way we process the Bible, we're just gonna eat what lines up with what we know to be true about Jesus. Jesus is going to be our filter. And how can we look at Jesus? Well, by doing just what he did, reading the words written by those who knew him best, those who saw the miracles that he performed and who were moved by the power with which he spoke. Thanks again, John, for writing all of that down so that we could read it today. 
So remember that big and slightly troubling question that we asked earlier, what is the Bible for? The answer is surprisingly simple, to know God and to know God most fully through Jesus. All of our other questions about the Bible are important and necessary to ask, but when we remember that God is the main character, everything starts to make a little bit more sense. The Bible helps us know God. This happens in a variety of ways, from stories to instructions, even historical details. Let's look at something Jesus said in order to know God better. And after we read it, I'm gonna give you just three questions to think through that will help you understand the verse. You can actually ask these questions for any verse that you've read or will read in the Bible. In a conversation with a religious leader, Jesus was asked which commandment was the greatest, and it was kind of a trap because the religious leader knew that no matter what Jesus picked as the most important, it would imply that something else was less important. Here's how Jesus answered. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Basically, Jesus says, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. That's what's most important. So knowing that about Jesus, answer these questions. Don't worry, I'll give you a little bit of time. Maybe you wanna just sit quietly and reflect on your own answer. Maybe you wanna write it down on a piece of paper or even in the notes app on your phone. Here's the first question. What does this teach me about God? Okay, so now that you've thought about it, here's what it's taught me. If Jesus cared about loving God and loving your neighbor, what does God care about? Well, God cares about love. So what do people think that God cares about most? Does that line up with what Jesus says? Is there anything that needs to change in the way that I see God? Those are all the types of questions that come up when I think about what that verse and what Jesus' response in that situation says about God. Okay, so here's the next question for you to consider. What does this teach me about me? Or another way to ask this question is, what does this teach me about humans in general? Take a little bit and think about your answer to that question. Okay, knowing what I learned about God by answering the question above, what can I learn about myself? Well, in this case, it teaches me that God assumes that I love myself. It's part of loving my neighbor. Almost like loving me is part of the package deal with loving God and loving others. And that that's a really important insight for me personally because I don't always do that well. But it makes me stop and think about what Jesus said and how it applies to my life today. Okay, and here's the last question for you to consider. What does this teach me about how I need to live or treat others? Think about your answer. Now, we might read like the best verse ever in our opinion and be so inspired by it, but if we don't know how to take that verse into our day-to-day -day lives, then it won't do us much good. So ask yourself, if I put it into practice, how would it affect the way that I treat my mom or, or my stepbrother? Or, or what do I need to do differently in light of the fact that Jesus says loving your neighbor is part of the greatest commandment. Those are great things to wrestle with as you follow up and think about that last question. Okay, so there's three questions. What does this teach me about God? What does this teach me about myself? And what does this teach me about other people? These three questions can help us understand the Bible better. And as we do, we'll get to know God better. And that's the whole point. The Bible helps us know God.
The truth is the Bible can be, it can be really confusing, but reading the Bible, knowing the purpose of the Bible will clear up some of those things. The purpose of the Bible is to know God better. So read the Bible with Jesus in mind. Let what Jesus says and does help you interpret the Bible. He, he's your filter, he's your strainer, he's your sifter, whatever you wanna call that thing. And he will make the rest of what you read clear. As you change the way you see the Bible, it'll be a good idea to talk with an adult you trust or someone that you can bring questions and thoughts to. In fact, your small group leader may be the best person for this. This is exactly why we have small groups, to be in a safe place where we can talk about what we're learning and what we're confused about. This week, start reading the letter that John wrote. Begin asking the three questions that we talked about. Type your thoughts into the notes section of your phone and then talk about them with your small group leader. We can't wait to hear what you learn about God in the process.